but if you haven't, don't, don't, don't worry. I'll give you extra time. So, before we continue with the material we started last time, let me pass the time sheet. Also, I have the, the homeworks here. You can pick your homework at the end of the, of the lecture. They are rate graded already. Okay, so wanted to do something before we continue with the lecture. If I have the model here, there's no markers. So I want to write the model in this part of the board because we're going to be referring to this model a lot. So this is the model for the Goico company. We have a maximization 3x1 plus 2x2 plus 5x3 subject to x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 less than or equal to 430 3x1 plus 2x3 less than or equal 460 x1 plus 4x2 less than or equal to 420 x1 x2 x3 greater or equal to 0. Do you remember what what was the meaning of each constraint? Why do we need a constraint or three constraints in this particular problem? I guess I can show you the model here. Okay, so we have a constraint for each operation. So we, we have three operations in our company. We are producing three different type of products. So operation one, operation two, and operation three. And X1, I believe, was the trains. X2 were trucks. And X3 cars. And so that was the, the example we were using in the class, which we were trying to maximize our profit, and we know the profit that we're going to make for each unit of trucks, which is X1, actually trains, trucks, and cars. Okay, so you remember this model. This was the example we were using. Okay, the concept that we were discussing last time was sensitivity analysis, and we started discussing the, this topic using the graphical illustration of an example. This example only had two variables, so you can find the solution easily using the graphical method. But that's not the case when you have more than two variables. So in this case, we have three variables. So there's no way that you can solve that problem so, uh, graphically. So for those type of problem, then we need to find out a different way to perform our analysis. So that's why we're using the algebraic method. Okay? Those cases in which you have more than two variables. Um, most of our discussion was basically about the dual path. Dual ties, shadow ties. Does anyone remember what the dual price is? So you are seeing how the objective function was changing if you increase or decrease the available resources that you have. 
So that dual price, shadow price, is the rate of change in your objective function. So if you increase, decrease your profit based on how do you change the number of hours that you have available for your resource. So in this problem you have three operations. So if you change these number of hours that you have available for your second operation, let's say you decrease that for 20 units, then the dual price is going to tell you how will that affect your objective function. Same thing when you increase your capacity. So if you increase the capacity of operation number two, dual price is going to tell you how that will affect your uh, optimal solution. So the dual price is a description of the rate of change of the objective function per unit change in resource. So if you change your capacity, number of hours that you have available um, um, for that particular operation in this case, then the dual price or the shadow price is going to let you know how will that affect your optimal Okay, so just want to give you that uh, background before we continue with our lecture. Okay, so just keep in mind what the dual price is, what the shadow price is, and because most of our discussion will revolve around this topic. Okay, so we went through this example. We were able to find the optimal solution for the problem, which is the maximization problem. And we found that the optimal production basically tells you that you should not produce any trains. You should produce 100 trucks and 230 cars. That's the optimal solution for this problem. Okay? So I asked you this in class, and you were able to tell me this based on the solution that you get from the optimal problem. And your optimal or your revenue, optimal revenue is $1,350. Any questions so far? Okay. So now we're going to apply some security analysis to this problem. And the same applies to any maximization type of problem in which you're looking at a production schedule or a number of units to produce. So we want to determine the dual prices. So the dual prices is going to tell you, again, how the, the rate of change of the objective function for unit of change in your resource. So we want to determine the dual prices for each one of the operations. Okay, so suppose that D1, D2, and D3 are the positive or negative changes made in the allotted daily manufacturing times of operations 1, 2, and 3 then this should be TOIKO instead of TOKYO. So TOIKO model can be changed to this. So what we're going to do is we're going to use these three variables, and we're going to add those variables to the number of hours that you have available right now, okay, to each one of the operations. So if D1 is 10, that means that you're going to have 440 units available for that first operation. Okay, so we want to determine what are those dual prices and what are the feasibility ranges for those dual prices for each one of the operations. So to e express the optimal simple tableau of the modified problems in terms of the changes in D1, D2, and D3, we first rewrite the starting tableau using the new right-hand side. So what you can do is, you can use the initial tableau, and you can add those three columns, one per 
dual vital. And you have an identity matrix here, which is basically letting, letting you know that D1 corresponds to the first row, D2 corresponds to the second row, and D3 corresponds to the third row. Okay, so if we repeat the same simplex iterations in the original model, the columns in the two highlighted areas will be the same or identical in the optimal tableau. So these three columns, which are the ones corresponding to the X4, X5, and X6, are going to be equal to these three columns. Okay? So the new optimum tableau provides the following optimal solution. So now we can express the optimal solution taking into consideration the dual prices. And that's what we're doing here. So if you look at the tableau, we have our optimal solution here. What we are doing is we are adding the corresponding variables with respect to the dual prices. So Z is going to be equal to 1,350 plus D1 plus 2 times D2. And the same applies for X2. So X2 is the basic variable for the first row. So you have 100 plus 1 half D1 minus 1 4 D2. And you can do the same thing for X3 and X6, which are the basic variables. So the optimal solution is again this now with those coefficients and variables with respect to the dual prices so the equation now shows that if you look at the objective function the dual prices the value of the objective function can be rewritten in this way so you are basically having the same optimal solution plus the dual variables times the coefficients corresponding to those dual prices. So by looking at the objective function, you can make the following conclusion. A unit change in operation 1, remember, D1 corresponds to the first operation, changes the objective function by $1. So if we increase the production of the first uh, unit, then it will increase your optimal solution by one dollar. If you look at the second operation, that will increase your operation by two. And a unit change in operation three will increase your objective function by zero. So increasing the capacity of the third operation will not improve your optimal solution. But if you increase the capacity of the second operation, your objective function will increase two dollars per unit that you increase in the second operation. So if you come here and you increase this to 461, that would mean that your objective function will increase by two dollars. Does that make sense? And that's what the dual price is telling you. So you can make decisions based on this and decide where you want to put your extra labor hours. From here you can see that if you increase this, that will give you the best profit. So for you, a good decision will be to, if you have extra hours, extra operation hours, you can put those in the operation that will give you more profit. Okay? So this means that by definition, the corresponding dual prices are one, two, and zero dollars per minute for operations one, two, and three, respectively. Okay? And as I mentioned earlier, this is the type of analysis that you will tend to do when you're looking at operation research models in industry. So it's not only that you find the optimal solution, you want to see also how will solution change if you decide to change your capacities in terms of your operation. Okay, so now that we know dual prices for each one of the operations, we can establish a feasibility range where the current solution remains feasible 
if all the basic variables remain non-negative. So you can find that feasibility range by saying that your basic variables will be greater or equal to zero. So if you simultaneously changes D1, D2, and D3, that satisfies these inequalities, will keep the solution feasible. Now the new optimal solution can be found by substituting out the values of D1, D2, and D3. For example, suppose that the manufacturing time available for operation 1, 2, and 3 are 480, 440, and 400. So now we are changing these three values that we have here for each operation to this 480, 440, and 400 minutes. Okay? So let me this 480, 440, and 400. So I decide to make that change in my operation. Then I can compute my dual prices as follows. So the difference will give me 50, 20, and minus 20. So substituting this in the feasibility conditions, we get the following. We get x2 equals 130, x3 equals 220, but x6 equals minus 120. That means that those changes will not keep the same solution in your objective function. That means that your optimal solution will be changed if you decide to make those changes. In this case, having a different solution, not the optimal, is basically telling you that you're going to have a worse a scenario or a not optimal performance. So that's the type of changes that you want to avoid. You want to, you want to keep your optimal production schedule and you don't want to change those conditions because that would affect your final profit. So you want to keep your final solution optimal and any changes that you want to make in your operation time will have to keep that solution optimal. The only way that you can change if those if you can check that those changes will keep your solution optimal is by looking at the feasibility conditions. So we establish that the feasibility conditions are that the values of the basic variables needs to be greater or equal to zero, and that is not satisfied by this basic variable. So those changes, the calculation shows that hence the current solution does not remain feasible. Now suppose that we, instead of changing that to 480, 440, and 400, we use these capacities. If you perform the same analysis, then you will find out that x2, x3, and x6 are greater than zero, which keeps the solution feasible. Okay, so the new optimal feasible solution is x2 equals 88, x3 equals 224, and x6 equals 78. Any questions? Okay, so again, we are looking at changing the capacities in our model and see how those capacities affect our optimal solution. The given conditions can prove the individual feasibility ranges associated with changing the resources one at a time. So if you want to see how the if you want to compute the feasibility range for each one of the operations, the only thing that you need to do is equal those the two original um, operations to zero and then solve for D1. So the simultaneous conditions can be reduced to if you equals if you let d2 and d3 equal to zero, then you're going to have your basic variables in terms of d1, 
And using the values for D1, you can establish the feasibility ranges for D1, which in this case is minus 210. Meaning that any value of D1 that is within this range will keep your solution feasible. Yes, sir. Uh, D1 here or yeah, here? Yeah. So you got the first D1 here, then you solve it, then the other one you got D1 here, then you solve it. Greater or equal to negative 300, so that means that you, you only have one side of the. So let me see if I'm following what you're trying to say. So you got D1 greater or equal to minus 200, and then you also got D1 greater or equal to minus 300. Yeah. So that means that this will be your condition. Okay? Good question. Any, any other question? Okay? So we can show in a similar manner that the feasibility ranges for operations two and three are the following. So we can now summarize the dual prices and the feasibility ranges for Tokyo model as follows. Okay, so I want you to look at this table and let me know where is, if there is a typo anywhere in this table. So if you find the typo, I'll give you a point for the naked set. <laughs> yes, that's correct. So this number should be 460. So the numbers are coming from the original problem. The current resource amount is coming from these equations or constraints. And the minimum and the maximum are basically, the minimum will be adding this portion of the feasibility rate, and the maximum will be adding the current plus the right hand of the feasibility rate. So if you look at the resource amount, you have the maximum and the minimum that you can have to keep your solution optimal. And also you have dual prices. Okay? So you compute this and using this, you can establish what would be the minimum and maximum that you can have in your problem or you're planning for the number of hours, so you will keep your solution optimal, and you can plan and keep the same solution. Okay? Any, any questions? So, as you can see for operation three, you can have a maximum of infinite. That will not affect your solution because the dual price is zero. So, independently of how many hours you put into your third operation, since the dual price is zero, it will not change your optimal solution. Yes. Good question. Yes. Any, any other comment? Okay. So, I guess this is where we stopped last time. So now we're going to transition to the second case. So what we were discussing is the change in this area of the problem. So we're changing the capacity of the operations. We're looking at the right-hand side of the model. And that's what we did with the graphical analysis as well. We started by looking at the right-hand side of the constraints, and then we moved to the second case which is basically looking at changes in your coefficients of the objective function. 
these are your revenues. So you want to know if you change the revenue that you're making for each one of your products, how would that affect your optimal solution? And that's the second case. So now we're going to look at that second case for the sensitivity analysis. So there's a concept called the reduced cost. And in the chemical model, the objective Z equation in the optimal tableau can be written as this. So if you look at your optimal tableau, which is here, you have a coefficient for x1, a coefficient for x4, and a coefficient that is different than zero for x5. So if you write your objective function for the optimal tableau, this is how the objective function will look like. So you have a coefficient for x1, a coefficient for x4, and a coefficient for x5. Does this give you any insight about your production? So remember, x1 represents your number of trades that you want to do. So the optimal solution is saying that if you produce Trains, your objective function is going to decrease by four dollars every time you produce an X-ray unit. So that's why the optimal solution does not produce any coin print. X1 equals zero. Because every time you produce an X-ray unit of that, you will get a minus four for your profit. And you are trying to maximize your profit. So that's why the optimal solution does not produce toy. <coughs> the reason can be seen from the Z equation, where a unit of a unit increase in X1, about current zero value, decrease Z by four. So you can see that from here. We can think of the coefficient of in the Z equation as the unit cost because it causes a reduction in the revenue. This cost that you have for that extra unit is what we call the reduced cost. Because that extra unit is going to be increasing your optimal solution by whatever the number of units it is. So in that case, by $4. Okay, so to facilitate the explanation of the objective function sensitivity analysis, first we need to define what reduced cost is. So the reduced cost per unit is equal to the cost of consumed resources per unit minus the revenue per unit. Okay, so to appreciate the significance of this definition in the original model, the revenue per unit of toy trucks is $2 is less than for toy trains, which is $3. So if you look here at the objective function, even though you are not producing any trains, your revenue is higher than that one for trucks. So even though you have more revenue by producing trains, you are not producing trains. Your optimal solution is telling you it's better for you to produce more of this one, even though your revenue is less. So this is what the slide is saying, that the optimal solution recommends producing toy trucks. The optimal solution is telling you 100 units and no toy trains. The reason is that the cost of the resources used by one toy truck, for example, the operation time, is smaller than its unit price. 
So even though you are making more profit, you are spending more time producing those type of products, which make the product more expensive. Okay, so if you spend more money producing the product, even, even though you are making more profit, is not better than producing a product that would not give you that more profit, but it's less expensive. So we can see that a um, profitable variable such as X1 can be made profitable in two ways. You can increase the unit revenue or by decreasing the unit cost of consumed resources. So those are the two options you have if you want to make that product profitable. In most situations, the price per unit is dictated by the market conditions and might be difficult to increase at will. So what you have at the end to deal with is the unit cost of consumed products or resources. Okay, so everybody understand what we're trying to explain here, even though this you make more revenue here, not necessarily profitable because you are spending more time producing that product, so it make you make the product more costly. Okay, so now that concludes the explanation for the reduced cost. Okay, so the optimal tableau will give you that reduced cost when you look at the objective function. You can see, for instance, why you are not producing a particular product. The objective function of the optimal tableau can tell you is because you are losing money by producing that particular product. Now, we can define optimality range. So the development in base is based on the definition of the reduced cost. So now we're going to look at those ranges for, for the optimal solution. So in the Toyko model, you can let D1, D2, and D3 represent the change in unit revenues for toy trucks, trains, and cars. Then the objective function becomes the maximization of z equals 3 plus d1 times x1 plus 2 plus d2 x2 plus 5 plus d3 x3. So this is similar to what we did with the right-hand side. Remember, we were adding that extra coefficient to the right-hand side in our first uh, part of the analysis. We we're looking at how changes in this area or in this right-hand side affect the optimal solution. We we're adding plus d1, plus d2, plus d3. Now we are focusing on the objective function. So that's why we are adding plus d1, plus d2, plus d3 in the coefficients of the objective function. So we first consider the general situation in which all the objective coefficients are changed simultaneously. So let's say we want to change all of them and see how would that affect my optimal solution. With the simultaneously changes, the zero in the starting tableau appears like this. So now instead of having the coefficients by themselves, you also have those extra coefficients, d1, d2, and d3, in your initial tableau for row z, or row zero. So when, you, when we generate the simplex tableaus, the optimal iteration will appear as follows. So this is your optimal solution. And as you can see now, you have multiple coefficients and your optimal solution is given in terms of D1, D2, and D3. 
So the near optimal tableau is the same as in the original tableau, except for the reduced cost. Okay, so those reduced costs are the reduced cost is associated with these new variables, the two, the three, and the one. This means that changes in the objective function coefficients can affect the optimality of the problem only. So the solution is the same. The only thing that is different is row zero. You really don't need to carry out the simplex row operations to compute a new reduced cost. So an examination of the new zero shows that the coefficients of, of row zero are taken directly from the constraint coefficient of the optimal tableau. So a convenient way for computing the new reduced cost is to add a new top row, like this one. We can add a new top row to the tableau for D1, D2, and D3, and a new leftmost column, like this one, to the optimal tableau. So those are highlighted here with this shaded area. So we have the optimal tableau, the original optimal tableau, so you have your row 0, 2, and 1, 2, and 3, and we are adding those this row and this column. How are you able to make this? So, you know D1 is associated to X1, D2 is associated to X2, and D3 is associated with D3. So, you, what we're trying to achieve here is to get this row from the optimal solution without having to compute all the top rows iteration by iteration. So if you compute, if you start your simplex method with this initial row and the other rows as the original problem, you can perform the simplex method and get to this tableau. This will be the optimal solution. What we're trying to, what I'm trying to explain now is you don't have to go through that process. You can solve the problem using the simplex method, the original problem, and then if you want to find out this row, you can use your optimal solution, and you add this row and this row, and using that information you can get this row. And that row is basically what we are trying to find in order to compute our feasibility rate. So let's say this is not there. Forget about this. Forget about this. The tableau is the optimal tableau for the simplex method. Now I want to find that those reduced costs for this problem. So what I want to do is I'm going to use that optimal solution and then I have this row and this row. And now I'm going to compute those reduced costs using my optimal solution. Okay, so D1 is always associated to X1, D2 is always associated to X2, and D3 is always associated to X3. These variables are not part of the original problem. You can see it from here. Those are slack variables. Okay, so you don't have to assign those uh, D, by D variables to those slack variables. When you look at the basic solution, same thing applies. So you know X2 is part of your basic solution, so you can assign D2 to X2. X3 has a D3, but X6 has no D variable associated to it because it is an, a slack variable. Okay, so only the original variable will have a D variable associated to it. So now we have this extra column and this 
this extra row and this extra column. And this is the exact same tableau. For the last most column, the top element is 1 in the 0, followed by change D1 for basic variable X1. Keep in mind that D I equals 0 for the slack variable. So to compute the new reduced cost for any variable, multiply the elements of its column by the corresponding elements in the left, left most column, and then add them up and subtract the top row of the element from the sum. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this coefficient times this, this coefficient times this, this coefficient times this, and this coefficient times this, and then subtract this value. And I'm going to show you that with with this same example. So let's look at this. So for X1, the reduced cost is the following. So as I was saying, you're going to multiply this times this. So this is 4 times 1. See if I can change the color. Then you have D2 times 1 4. So it's minus 1 4 times D2. D3 times 3, 3 half. Plus 2 times 0. And all that minus D1. Which is here. So going back, we are computing the reduced cost for X1. So you go look, using the optimal tableau from your simplex method. You do 4 times 1 plus minus 1 4 times D2 plus 3 half times D3 plus 2 times 0. That's this part. And then subtract D1. Yes. You can uh, subtract this part is subtract subtracting the top row. So any coefficient, any d value that is in the top row, that's what you're going to subtract here. That wasn't used. Uh, yeah, even though it's not showing up here, it is mostly related to the actual order of your variables and the actual order of your D values at the top. So you're going to list those D values according to your original value, right? So you know you're solving for X1 today. So you're trying to find the reduced cost for X1. So what you're going to do is you're going to look at the column of X1 and you're going to multiply those coefficients by the new column here in your tableau. These numbers or these D values are associated to the variables that are here. You don't see the one here because X1 is not part of your basic value. So X2 is part of your basic variable. That's why you have the D2 coefficient here or D2 variable here. Same thing for X3. 
x6 case it's lag variable so you don't have any d value associated to it which is the same that happens here okay so what i'm trying to find here by performing these operations is <coughs> this Okay, so again, this is the optimal tableau as well, well, but by solving it using the lead coefficient from the star. I want you to go through that process. Okay. If you find the optimal solution for your problem, then you can compute the reduced cost by just adding this row and this column and performing these operations. You'll find the same values. Um, so, this is equal to 4 minus 1, 4 D2 plus 3 half D3 minus D1. And that's just solving the that equation. Okay, so for my optimal solution, <clears throat> the current solution remains optimal so long as the new reduced cost, C equation coefficients, remain non-negative for the maximization case. So that's very important. That's for the maximization case. For the minimization case, it will be the opposite. Okay? So we does have the following simultaneous optimality conditions corresponding to non-basic x1, x2, and x4. So, if you perform the same operations for that should be, sorry, it should be x1 so check your your slides and make sure that you have x4, x4 and x5. I think that was a typo that I changed before the lecture. Okay, so we does have the following simultaneous optimality conditions corresponding to non-basic x1, x4, and x5. So we have four. minus 1, 4, D2, plus 3, 2, D3, minus D1. One plus 1 half D2, greater or equal to 0. This is also greater or equal to 0 and 2 minus 1 4 plus d2 plus 1 half d3 so if you perform the same operations for this column that will give you this if you perform for D3, that will give you this. Oh. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. These are the simultaneous optimality conditions corresponding to the non basics. So remember that the reduced cost for a basic variable is always zero, as the modify optimal tableau show. Uh, for example, suppose that the objective function of toicos is changed from the original, which is this one, three x1 plus 2x2 plus 5x3 to this one, in which we are decreasing the first coefficient, the second coefficient, and increasing the last one. 
then G1 will be the difference between 2 minus 1, D2 is 1 minus 2, and D3 is 6 minus 5. Five. This is, this should be two minus three. We have six. Minus 5, 1 minus 2, and 2 minus 3, and that's minus 1. This is coming from the difference between the coefficients. So, D, the coefficient for the new one minus the old one, 2 minus 3 is minus 1, 1 minus 2 is minus 1, and C minus 5 is 1. This is just given. Oh, okay. This is an example. Yes. So you're making those, uh, you're, you're saying, I'm going to try these new values for the revenues and see if my problem is still optimal. So basically what you're saying is you're increasing the profit that you're making for parts. And you want to see how will that affect your optimal solution. <clears throat> so we have for the optimality conditions coming from the previous slide which are here you have 4 minus 1 4 times minus 1 plus 3 half times 1 minus 1 times minus 1 and that equals 6.75 and this is greater than 0 then the second one is 1 plus 1 half times minus 1 and that equals 1 half and this is greater than 0 so this is satisfied that one is satisfied and then the last one 2 minus 1 4 times minus 1 plus 1 half times 1 that would equal 2.75 and is greater than 0 it is also satisfied so the conditions are, all, all of them are feasible with the values of the new coefficient. They will give you an optimal solution. Okay? So that's basically what we are trying to find out with these conditions. You adjust your revenues, would you keep the same optimal solution? And if all, if you use no reduce cost, and you find that all of them are greater than zero, then those conditions are satisfied, which means that even though you change your revenues for each product, you will keep the same optimal solution. So you will keep um, producing the same number of units that you were producing for the original problem. The results show that the proposed changes will keep the current solution optimal with the new value of z equals this which is 1,480, so that means that you're making more profit with the same solution. So if you adjust those prices, you can make more money. Originally it was 1,350, they are making $130 more 
by adjusting those prices and keeping the same production uh, that you plan for the original you know, crop. Okay? So that's, so remember the original solution was 1350 Now you changed your revenues for those products and you're making more money with the same uh, number of hours that you have originally and the same production schedule that you plan. The preceding discussion has dealt with the maximization case. The only difference in the minimization case is that the reduced cost, Z equations coefficients must be less than or equal to zero to maintain optimal. Okay, so again, this analysis, a computer can give you these numbers. But you have to go through this learning process to understand what's going on. I mean, when you see those numbers in the computer, they will not make sense if you don't understand what's happening. So now that you understand how to compute those reduced costs, what's the meaning of the reduced costs? what's the meaning of the dual price, and so on, we can perform sensitivity analysis using the computer. So you can log into your computer, and let's, let me show you just really quick how can you perform this analysis using the solver. So just log in, and we can, can walk you through the, the example. So if you go to your to your account in Fax, there should be a Excel file for for the problem for this problem. So if you can download that file, that's what we're going to use for for the discussion. The name of the file is. Lecture 8, IE 340-225. I believe that the file name. Were you able to find it? Okay, so I'll download that file. And what you're going to see is the model. It's the exact same model, original model. So you have one constraint for operation, for each operation. You have train, trucks, cars, and you have your solution, your optimal solution. So if you solve your problem using the solver, after you click in the solver parameters dialog box, you can request a sensitivity analysis report in the new dialog box over you solve. So once you solve the problem, this is what you're going to see. If you look at this box here, that gives you the option of requesting the sensitivity. So if you click there, and then hit OK, the Excel file will give you an extra uh, worksheet. It's a separate worksheet that will give you the report for the sensitivity. The report uses the name shadow price instead of dual price. But as we learn in class, it's the same. So dual price and shadow price is the same. And is the description of the change of rate of the objective function for a unit change on the resource. So this is what you should see in your Excel file. So let me go back to the file.
So if we go data solver and you solve, this is what you're going to see. You can click here, click sensitivity, and then hit OK. You will have a report here for sensitivity. Okay? Okay, so let's look at this first. So remember the, the dual prices for, for our operations were 1 and 2. And if you look at the bounds that we compute, let me show you that in here. Okay, so remember we computed these dual prices, one and two, and the minimum, maximum, and the current values for your dual prices, or for the changes in your capacity that will keep the optimal solution. If you look at the Excel report, you will be able to see the same analysis. <coughs> From here, you'll see that the final value, dual price or shadow price for each operation, and the minimum, actually this is the current value, the allowable increase for the lower bound, and uh, for the upper bound and for the lower bound, okay, which is the same numbers that we have in the table. Now, top of the analysis is corresponding to changes in the objective function. <coughs> this one is looking at the capacities, this analysis, and we change the values of the right-hand side. That is the constraints. That is this part of the analysis. This part is corresponding to the changes in the revenue, in the objective function. Okay? So, remember the reduced cost for X1 was 4, meaning that if you produce X1, that would take $4 for each unit that you produce from your objective function or for your optimal solution. That is this value. So, the reduced cost for each value is listed here. So for x1, the reduced cost is minus 4, and that gives you the objective coefficient as well, which are here, and also the increase and the decrease that will keep your optimal solution the same. Okay, any questions? So, in the exam, I can give you this table and ask you questions from it. Uh, if I, if you see this, if I tell you should I produce units for X1 or for trucks, trains actually, so if I tell you X1, X, X1 is trucks, should I produce trucks? That's the type of question that you should know how to answer based on a report like this. Um, if I tell you should I decrease? My operating hours for operation one to 400, and 400 hours or minutes, I'm sorry, these are minutes. Should I reduce my operation hours to 400 and keep the same optimal 
to take the same optimal or if the solution will stay the same? How would you answer? If I change this number to 400, would that keep my optimal solution the same? Yes, because you can decrease this by 200. Okay, so those are the types of your questions. Mm -hmm. And if you're working on a particular problem in your company when you are out there, you perform these analysis, you can decide how you allocate your resources. And you will keep the same collection. And if you have an employee that is not showing up some day of the week, you can plan ahead and say, okay, so this is not that important in this area. I will move another person to that area. I will keep the same level of production. Okay? So, I have time for questions. Any? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, you said if you reduce the mm -hmm. the will be the values for the decision variable will be the same, which is your optimal solution. Okay? The, okay, so that's a good question. Your optimal solution is given by the values of your variables. Right? So x1 equals 1, x2 equals 2, x3 equals 5. Okay? You can change the revenue that you make by changing the coefficients of your objective function and still keep the same solution. That's what I'm referring to with keeping the optimal solution. You are not changing the values of the decision variables, but the objective function value can change. Okay? So your optimal solution is based on the values of your decisions. Your decisions are not changing, but maybe if you increase the revenue or the the revenue that you want to make from another product, you can increase, let's say, x3. And that was one of the examples. You increase that by one unit, you will make an extra dollar. You keep the same solution. Okay? So, I think I'm going to stop here. You have the homework due after spring break. So, please take a look. The homework is based on the material we, we cover up to you today, which is sensitivity analysis. If you have questions, you can send me emails. Uh, I will reply. And also, your homework is here, so you can pick up your homework. Where's the time? So here's the homework. And I'll see you after spring break. Yeah, that's a good break.